It's not just the old field and the old players, but the way they fit into the whole old way of life, growing up in a city bustling with nearly a million people. Factories, schools, churches, clubs, streetcars, buses, families, friends, and two baseball teams sharing the same North Side Park at Grand and Dodier. It was a time when kids could join the Knothole Gang and see a game for free, and you went on your own, a late afternoon game and then home for supper, a Saturday game and then you could push your way onto a crowded streetcar with plenty of change in your pocket and plenty more to do. A lot of times we'd go, go to a movie there. We'd ride the streetcar down to the Fox or to St. Louis, and we'd always go to White Castle at Grand and Bell. Hamburgers were a nickel then. And then on, if we happened to go on a weekday, I think there was a day when they were like six for a quarter. <laughs> We'd get six of them and eat them up. The city basically in those days was north-south. Great public transportation. So in 1930 when I was 12 and 1931 when I was 13, I went to World Series by myself. In the middle of the night, brown bagging it, getting in line the bleachers, stand in line, and, and you know, till you get in around nine o'clock and they'd have a band play to kind of entertain you in, in the morning and then they practiced early. And when I was uh, in the seventh grade when I went, the next day I was at school and the teacher said, what were you yesterday, Robert? Well, I said, Miss Prendable, I was at the World Series. And she smiled, she said, I'm glad you told me so. I saw you standing in line. The moment you get there, everybody you meet was just like a, a friend or neighbor, even though you didn't know them or where they came from, but you got greeted like, like you've been knowing them all the time, you know, because people came to the ballpark in those days for enjoyment. The good old days, sure, when you might be stuck sitting behind one of those posts and you really need hindsight to see how quaint that was. But if it is just talk, if it really wasn't better in some ways, and what's with this grass? And why create nooks and crannies where there used to be clean lines? Because perfection isn't perfect. In baseball and in life, there is delight in disorder. The atmosphere was absolutely nothing like Bush Stadium, nothing. Uh, Bush Stadium is so colorful and so pretty and so everything, and uh, Sportsman's Park would, I would say, would be just the opposite of what Bush Stadium is now. But uh, who cared? I mean, you were at the ballpark, you know, and at those, in those days, we didn't think anything of it. You know, you just went because you wanted to be there. That's, uh, in, in fact, I didn't think too much about it the park. I can remember walking up that ramp there every single Sunday and getting our seats and getting our uh, peanuts and our, our popcorn or your Coke or whatever you'd have, you know. It was fun, really fun. It had grass. Of course it had grass. You wouldn't play baseball on anything else unless you were playing in the street or on the playground. But even then, baseball grass was special and you knew it the first time you saw it. Well, in 27 Memorial Day, I'll never forget it, my uncle, my mother's brother, agreed to take me. So I go charging up from the ground level to the level of where, the, where the field began. And I tell you, I never saw a sky that was bluer or a, or a grass that was greener or a white that was whiter than the creamy uniforms of the ball players. Uh, I remember the short right field porch, as they called it, and sometimes they had a screen there, sometimes they didn't. Uh, the grass looked like it was uh, out of a burpee catalog. I mean, it was just so perfect. It was, I don't think I've ever seen grass like that ever again, except for in a ballpark. You didn't just sit back and watch from a distance. That's the thing everybody remembers about Sportsman's Park, how close you were to the players, how much you, were a part of the game. You were still close enough to the field and involved in the action that you could see the expressions on people's faces. You could hear some of the language, you know, uh, which wasn't always the best. 
and uh, you were into the game. You had a closer feeling. You weren't in this uh, mega complex. Yes, very much so. Yeah, you could even hear the words if you wanted to. You know, you, know, you knew what was going on. It was different, a lot different, a whole lot different than what you have today. Well, you, you're not in the flow of what everything is. I mean, you know, it, you could just hear. You know, they. It, it was more intimate than what you have today. I mean, your kids today. Like, if you're lucky to sit up in the sky dome up there, while you're five thousand feet away, there was no. See, Maybe it has to do with the way the park started out. Not as an urban renewal project or a part of the convention and tourism business, and not as a way of proving that St. Louis was a world-class city. It started out in 1866 as a place to play ball. The old Browns played there, they'd later become the Cardinals, and then the new Browns of the American League came in, and as the professional teams built up the field, the city grew up with it and grew up around it. The location was a good one for the times, right along the main north-south streetcar line, so that Sportsman's Park was there in the midst of a busy urban neighborhood, across from the YMCA and businesses, factories, taverns, and homes. The drama and the characteristic of a lot of different shaped ballparks was interesting. But really, why, why they were built the way they were was because of the real estate. All ballparks had to be built near public transportation, which in the old days was streetcars and then ultimately buses. So we had a rectangle here because that was a rectangular area. They, and that Sportsman's Park area, by the way, is probably the only one, I think, now still being used to play ball on when that thing goes back to the Civil War. As the crowds grew and the business of baseball grew, the stadium grew. Bleachers replaced the wooden fences, upper decks were added. The result was a park like no other. Not necessarily better in every way, just a place unique to St. Louis, our park. When a player took the field, he knew exactly where he was and the adjustments he'd have to make. Well, I think the first game I saw at Sportsman's Park was really the Browns. And at that time, Babe Ruth, the only park he played left field in was at Sportsman's. All the rest of the time played right field at all the other parks because of the sun conditions. Right field was, was very terrible in the late afternoon sun. The louvers there, that sun would shine through it. If you played right field, it was awfully tough on the eyes. It was an interesting part because uh, for left-hand hitter, uh, I, I, we all liked it because it had a short right field. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, yes, it was a good ballpark. The fans were close enough. You can see the game. It was every seat was a pretty pretty good seat. So uh, our Sportsman's Park was uh, was a good ball park, uh, except uh, you know the the infield in St. Louis in the summer was really hard and uh, I, with me playing first base, uh, sometimes my feet would get awful hot. <laughs> the heat still defines baseball in St. Louis. It seems sometimes that just about everything else has been cleaned up and covered up. In a pristine space like Riverfront uh, in Cincinnati or Three Rivers in Pittsburgh or Bush Stadium in St. Louis, it's sufficiently pristine that there's nothing there that, I think, I think this is part of the nostalgia, there's nothing there that just sort of screams us. Them guys that played back then, they'll play for the fun of the game too, or the love, whatever you want to say. It was not the money that was in there, because I remember, like usual, when they had bad years, they wanted to take a pay. Admittedly, our memories are selective. Imagine a group of old guys 50 years from now talking about the good old days. They'll be talking about AstroTurf and Ozzie Smith. Now those guys, they could play. 
And let's face it, we're never going to see anything like that in Bush Stadium again. So coming up, more selective highlights. The days of the knothole gang and the days when corkball was king. You know, that wall between the box seats and the stands is pretty low, and yet over the years, it seems to have grown and grown as a barrier between those who play the game and those who watch the game. And the ball clubs know that, so a few special days out of the year you can get on the field to take pictures, or kids can get on after the game to run around the bases. Well, that's a lesson taken right out of the good old days, when a chance to get on the field was just part of going to Sportsman's Park. It began as a ball field, and Sportsman's Park seemed to be built around the game itself. Built to serve the people who used to stand in the outfield or near the sidelines. And it was a long time that feeling survived. Into the 1930s, the stadium announcer was still on the field shouting out the lineup. He would stand behind home plate with a double-handed megaphone. The megaphone was very large, double-handed and with a booming voice, he would read the batting order to the press radio level, which meant that people in close to home plate got that. But then he would waddle, and I mean waddle, because he was heavy down to third base and just get the battery. When he made a batting change, by the time he got through with the change, the inning was over. Before the electric organ, or blasting rock songs, if you heard any music, it was likely to be coming from a high school band sitting in the stands. The old time stadium still had things in common with the school athletic field or the playground. Players would trot in off the field empty handed, leaving their mitts out on the diamond near their position. Watch the shortstop after he makes the inning ending play. You'd think it wouldn't be safe, but nobody remembers anybody ever getting hurt or losing a game because of a mitt on the field. And if you've ever wondered why some of the old action photos look so good from those days, it's because photographers were on the field, gathered near home for the batter, or near first or third if they were expecting a play there. You didn't need a telephoto lens, not even to get a picture, when Browns owner Bill Vex sent Eddie Goodell up to bat. The famous picture of the midget. If Bill Vick hadn't tipped me off the night before we were drinking, we would never have had a picture because the photographer would have been long gone. And now he was there, but he was able to get out on the field and he kneeled on what you and I would call the on deck circle to be that close to the midget. All of this, plus the physical closeness of the fan to the game, made a huge difference in the ballpark experience, a difference that was easier to feel than to explain. Adding public address systems and making rules, removing gloves and photographers made sense, but they removed some of the informality of baseball. There was a time when kids knew what it was like to share the field with their heroes. Yeah, the kids would run around on the field. They, they didn't stop the, the kids at that time after the games were over. Yeah, you could do it then, but now you can You get on the field, you get arrested. They don't want you on the field. But back in Sportsman Park, you could do it all the time. Everybody would talk to the, the players and everything, and they did it. A foreigner watching his very first baseball game probably wouldn't figure it's the sort of game you could play just about anywhere. You have to grow up with baseball to know that. I remember after a Cub Scout meeting at Russell Moreland's house, we all came into the alley behind his building to play softball, and you could hit it off the fence or off a garage door or even into the garbage cans. But if you were going to hit a fly ball, you had to hit it to center. And I mean straight away center. Now, that's not a great baseball story, but it's a great memory of growing up with the game. And in that way, Jimmy the Kid is no different than Stan the Man. Well, I, uh, I played at every opportunity. Oh, we had a short field with a short right field. We only had one ball. And being, being a left-hand hitter, I didn't, didn't want to hit the ball over the right field because uh, we'd have to chase it down, run, around, run it down, and take five minutes or so. They had a left field that was on like a hillside there. And when you hit the ball in the, in that, uh, up against the uh, left field, the ball was in play. I 
subconsciously learn how to hit the opposite field. And that's a great asset as far as the hitter goes. And so Stan the Man was out there just like the rest of us, chasing balls into the weeds. And that may be a big reason that ball players and spectators seem to be in the same game. So there's this sort of sense that somehow these baseball players are like us. They're regular guys. They look like regular guys. Some of them are overweight, some are short, some are tall and skinny. Uh, you know, there's all this sort of regular guy feel. Television may have been one of the big things that made regular guys into modern celebrities. The camera brought their images and their accomplishments into homes around the country, but it left a lot of their humanity back on the field. And you've got to see them, hear them, and maybe even exchange a word with them to really see that they are regular guys, and maybe to remind them of that as well. Back in those days, you knew players something like personal. Players at that time was very, very familiar. You know, you could walk up to any ball player, shake his hand, and get an autograph if necessary, and you get a laugh out of him. But now they are just so distant from you. You know, you never get a chance to see one. You never get a chance to shake one's hand unless on a special day. You know, but back in those days, you know, you could have, you could brush shoulders with baseball players all the time. You know, Babe Ruth used to carry a bunch of balls pre-game and throw, throw them up to the kids in the, in the bleachers. The ball players parked their cars behind Powell's, I can remember the stand, Powell's stand. And they would park behind her and boy, these guys would stand there for hours and give autographs and think nothing of it. I'm including Mr. Music, the finest man that there ever is. You could get an autograph a lot easier than you can now. Well, I mean, you think Paul got a ball player? I remember Chet Labs, him. He goes, hey, Chet, how about an autograph? Well, he'd give it to you in a minute. Hey, that's the way they were. Uh, we were waiting for the, the pitcher to, to go into the clubhouse and get his autograph, and sure enough, we got an autograph of Vinegar Ben Mizell. And I was ecstatic, but I think my dad liked it more because Vinegar Ben was one of his favorite players. It has to do with how players feel about being heroes, and I think that is. Those players that had a real keen sense that being a hero uh, carries a lot of weight. Stan Musial is a classic example of that. Stan Musial, I don't know if he'll, he will say it in these words, but he knows that being a hero is a full-time job. And being a hero is a lifetime job. What baseball heroes do is something extraordinary under the most ordinary of circumstances. They're just doing what we all did as kids, hitting and running and sliding. It's not a complicated game. You don't need a lot of fancy equipment to play, especially in St. Louis where crowns or bottle caps would do, or that little ball made of cork. I liked it. I was so little anyway, I, you know. But, but court ball, you could you could all you could always sneak that hit in there with that stick. But court ball, oh yeah, I, I love it. We used to use broomsticks for bats at that time because we couldn't afford them little cart ball bats. Sometimes we we'd improvise when we didn't have a cart ball. We tie things together and make a card ball. We used to play it in the alley. I used to play it in the I shouldn't be telling you these things. <laughs> I used to play card ball with the boys in the alley. And I used to, it was, it was like anything else that told the card ball to you. And uh, you had, uh, we used to use uh, broom handles for our bat. Yeah, broom handles. 
and uh, that's all. You know, then you'd have a base to run to and all this and that. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Well, a phenomenon of the cockball gaining more than local popularity was a result of World War II. Uh, St. Louis guys who had played this game, uh, well, they played it regularly. Now they go as a service. A lot of them, like, particularly to ships at sea, you take an aircraft carrier, you could stand on a deck and play cockball. You know, if you lose an occasional ball, so what? But uh, and a bat could always be a broomstick, or, or they're worse, thin bats shaped just about like a broomstick, except they had a handle. Well, the Grady Company made them, and all of a sudden, the Grady Company was getting orders and requests from all over the world for the for the cart ball. I suppose people in every city have their own special memories about the way they play the game and about their special teams, just as we feel about the Cardinals and for the very loyal few, the St. Louis Browns. But St. Louis is special in its own way because it let kids into a lot of games for free as members of the Knothole Gang. Yeah, it was good PR for the team, but it was also a long-term investment and one that is still paying off. In the new stadiums, those posts that used to hold up the upper decks are gone. But today there seem to be so many other things that spoil the view of the ball game for us, and maybe some of those things can be fixed as well. But still, it's hard to imagine today telling a 10 or a 12-year-old kid, here's a couple of bucks, get out of the house, go to the ballpark, just make sure you're home for supper. There are so many things on the outside of the stadium that we can probably never change back. Sportsman's Park was it was like a home away from home for a lot of guys too. To me, a South Sider, it was north. I lived 4,500 south. That was 2,700 north. You you couldn't very well walk it. It's pretty pretty long haul. Well, even though the game was at three o'clock, you could hurry down, catch a streetcar, and get to the ballpark. Half hour later, you might get in the second inning. Of course, the fun was when school was out. Then you could get there early enough to noontime to watch batting practice and everything. But that. That was great. We'd ride the streetcar over. Sometimes we walked across the Age Bridge, and that cost us a nickel. Then we'd take a streetcar out to Sportsman's. We'd have to transfer it grand. Oh, you walk. We walk. We walk down. We walk most of the way. Hitchhike, whatever we could do. Roller skated, whatever. <laughs> Wasn't nothing to see a kid come in a park with a pair of roller skates, you know. But of course, for some, Sportsman's Park was literally just across the street. Because it wasn't downtown, those who lived around the North Side neighborhood saw it not just as the city's ballpark, but as one of the local businesses. It was our whole livelihood around there for everybody, or any you know, kids my age and that. We either sold soda or popcorn or scorecards or things like that, or turnstile boys. I mean, there's a lot of activity always going on in the neighborhood. Well, I was a clubhouse boy first. I started picking up soda bottles in 43. Then I became the visiting bat boy in 46, 47. And in 48, I had the Cardinals. In 49, I had the Browns and the Cardinals. I would have done it for nothing. I got a dollar a day. <laughs> yes, I loved it. When it's over, you walk home for supper. You go home supper back then. It was it like 5 or 5.30? And I mean, it was with mom and dad and brothers and sisters. And 
you know, today they eat when they want or whatever they do, but we had a certain time you had to be home, and that was it. We always had dinner together, all the time. The family, that was a requisite. We all had dinner together. And Mother used to always say, now if you girls have got anything to say, say it. Because once the boys get going, you'll never get in, because the boys always started on their baseball. All over the country, kids talked baseball. But St. Louis kids especially felt they belonged, felt welcome in Sportsman's Park. By just signing up, you could become a member of the Knothole Gang, and you could watch the Cardinals for free. So if you wonder what the old days have that we've lost, talk to a Knotholer. They feel a bond to their team and to each other to this very day. Yeah, you sign up for the Knothole Gang, and you got a membership card, and, uh, and it also titles you to a day off of school, you know, to go see a game. The whole school district could go at one time. They had one day set for it. And we look forward to that. I, well, I belong to the not whole gang. Of course, we, used, we got our tickets. Uh, the reason we got into it was through the ward here. In other words, you're all or you're, you know, and, and representative. Somebody could get you that pass. That entitled you to, boy, did we love it because we couldn't afford to go otherwise. But the Not Whole Gang, what that did, for the Cardinals in particular, the Browns didn't do the same thing. Well, here you got the Cardinals, the better team, letting the kids in for nothing, and the Browns, the poorer team, not doing that. Well, eventually they did, but by that time, a lot of us had been won over by the Cardinals. For that generation, there is a different attitude because teams worked at making them fans. And the Cardinals organization is one of the real leaders, one of the real innovators in this with their knothole gangs. And it's not just in St. Louis, they had it in their minor league stadia as well. What are they really doing? Well, what they're doing is they're taking those 10, 12, 13 year olds and they're making them ball fans. And specifically, they're gonna make them, in that case, Redbird fans, or here they're gonna make them Cardinals fans. They're gonna make them ball fans so that when they have grandchildren, they're gonna take them back to the same park and have those same memories. Uh, you know, is it merchandising? Well, to an extent. Are they working the crowd? Well, to an extent they are. But what they're doing is going out of their way to pay attention to the fan experience. Ladies' Day was the same idea, bringing a whole new group of fans, get them to like the game and feel comfortable in the stadium, just as today's marketing people target families. Of course, back then, there were so many more day games. Claire and I used to do, we used to sit out in the bleachers in the early spring to get our beginning of our suntan. Day games were a real community event. I mean, that was, you know, uh, you've got, you got uh, the businessman, the uh, quasi-professional, and the factory worker out at a ball game then. And that was good, it was nice. They all mixed, they mingled together, and, and they were there for one common purpose. You buy uh, a beer, a soda, the man standing in the aisle and pass it down, right through white, black, passing right on down until it get to you, you know. Nobody had any ill feeling about it. And, and uh, the man sitting next to you, if he hadn't, didn't have his money ready, you paid for it and let him get on out of here, you know. And it, it could be a white man, it could be a black man, anybody. You just pay for it because everybody was there for the same thing, to have a good time. And they left home with that on their minds, going to have a good time. You had North St. Louis, South oh, St. Louis, yeah. the West End, wherever they came from in Nighthole. You never seen no problems or no, uh, what you call, amosity amongst each other. This kid might have had, you know, $10 in his pocket. John and me may not have had nothing, and maybe Henry had a couple of bucks. But I'm talking about you had all these different communities, Clayton, wherever they come from. But you never had no problems in the Nighthole, because if you had it, you lost your car. The 50s brought a whole new era, and not just television. The Browns moved off to Baltimore, and the brewery took over the Cardinals and the stadium. 
and this should sound familiar, it spent a lot of money to give it a new look and a new feel. When Bush took it over, it became a beautiful ballpark, I think. I don't think there was a prettier ballpark going. They bought it in 53, and but in 54, they spent about two and a half million dollars, which was a lot of money then to enhance it. But before that, Gussie, on his first trip east with the Cardinals, I said, Gus, you're going to see something most unusual. I said, our ballpark is cluttered with a lot of junky stuff on the walls, but Brooklyn's have its feel as worse. It looks like a circus. On the other hand, I said, you're going to see the polo grounds. It's completely green, beautiful green, no, no sign, but one big Chesterfield sign. I said, you know, like, like one big Budweiser sign would be. He said, let me see it, pal. Well, when he came back, he said, you're right. But there was the lack of a central location, lack of good parking and easy highway, not streetcar access. And there were bad seats behind the screen in right field and behind any of the posts throughout the stadium. There was great excitement in the 1960s about the dramatic changes taking place downtown and plenty of good reasons for the enthusiasm for the brand new ballpark. They were constructing it then. I asked one of the workmen if I could go up and pick out the seat that I wanted. And he said, sure, sure, that's all right. There were a lot of people wandering around down there, you know. And I took the number of the seat down and that was it. They took home plate from the old park and put it in the new. And in its first days, the new Bush Memorial Stadium had a grass field. But the old and the new parks were miles apart in more ways than one. Going to the new stadium, people were just anxious to get in this modern facility. You know, they had an automatic uh, infield machine that covered the, the, the infield with a tarpaulin whenever it rained and it would roll it up and roll it back in it. Uh, and with the uh, better conveniences for the fans, you know, more concessions and, and just being more out in the sun and no posts, no pillars, structural uh, pillars and posts. Uh, all these things were built as, as the modern stadium of, of the 60s. And it was, it was a, a showcase, it really was. It's nice, it's modern, it's progress and all of that but it's no comparison to the other park in comparison to the ball players. Because see, the other ball players, you could almost touch them if you got down there close to the field where now you're too far away from the ball players, but that's prog progress, so you just have to look at it that way, you know. The old stadium, once the home of two major league baseball teams, the neighborhood park came down. People will say, oh, you know, the neighborhood changed, but it's a lot more than that. It's the whole city that changed in so many ways. And so did the business of professional sports. And of course, the people who were kids back then, they changed too. Going to the Sportsman's Park was just, uh, uh, we, we took the, the Del Mar streetcar down to Grand and then over. and. And uh, it was just, the, the trip going there was almost as exciting as just being there, because it was building up to like Christmas almost, you know. And once you got in the stadium, it was like unwrapping the package on Christmas Day. Around the time the Cardinals moved into Sportsman's Park, another hometown team was going to bat for St. Louis, the Southwest Bank team. Established in 1920, Southwest Bank is still headquartered in the same building that was once a corner tavern bought from the Bush family. Like the Cardinals, Southwest Bank has grown with the community, values the loyalty of its longtime supporters, and even shared the company of Stan the Man, a Southwest Bank board member in the 1950s. Southwest Bank, St. Louis's hometown banking team since 1920. Additional funding for this program was provided by the Elberth R. and Gladys Flora Grant Charitable Trust.